Mario. You know him, I know him, he's Mario. Everybody loves Mario. But sometimes, he does stupid stuff. Like fighting this guy, or this guy, or even that guy. And then, he started not being stupid, but now, he's in danger of going back. And I don't like it, so I've decided to complain on the internet. I have a Patreon. With the release of 3D All-Stars, I've been playing a lot of Mario games. In the past few months, I've gone through the original, Mario 3, 64, Sunshine, both Galaxy games, 3D World, and Bowser's Fury for the first time. And what I've realized during that process is that while I like many of these bosses, they don't feel very cohesive with everything else going on. In fact, that applies to most platformer bosses I've faced over the years. After all those bad experiences, the desire to put boss fights in platformers began to strike me as misplaced. In an action game, you spend most of your time engaging with the combat, so a boss fight serves as a climactic test of everything you've learned up to that point. You have to be good enough at figuring out how to respond to the enemy's attack patterns and executing on those plans. In a platformer, the main thing you're doing is, well, platforming. Metroidvanias are often considered a subgenre of 2D platformers, but many of them use platforming as one of their minor focuses, so I definitely wouldn't categorically build them that way. When I say platformer, I mean a game that centers around using your character's movement abilities to get from point A to point B in interesting ways, typically with lots of jumping, although not always. Even if you can manage to create an interesting fight around a moveset that isn't designed for combat, it fundamentally can't provide the same type of test of skills in an action game, since the boss fights and the rest of the game are asking you to do two different things. At best, this makes them feel out of place, but at worst, it can make encounters on the difficult side feel more frustrating than fair since you're not used to dealing with them. Some bosses are able to fit with the rest of a game in ways other than the platforming, like the Mega Hammer from Super Mario Galaxy 2. While platformers are obviously going to focus on platforming, they're also a popular genre for introducing and expanding on level gimmicks, with most of them doing so to varying degrees. This level is all about using Yoshi to swallow bullet bills and chucking them back to break stuff, so you damage Mega Hammer by doing just that while he attacks you with his giant hammer hands. It might not test your platforming chops, but it does expand on the concepts you've been learning throughout the level. It's a step in the right direction. But what if fights could use the same level ideas, and the same gameplay style as what you've just been playing? What would that even look like? When bringing elements from one game or genre to another, it's best not to just directly translate them, but figure out what they achieve and try to replicate that. For platformers, this can mean creating an encounter with a foe that you're still fighting against, but you have to actually platform in order to defeat them. Whereas in an action game, you'd have to deal enough damage to kill the boss without dying yourself. This takes the purpose of a boss fight, a climactic test of your skills thus far, and adapts it to suit platforming. Even the Mario series seem to have learned this lesson. From the original Super Mario Bros. to Galaxy, all of the final Bowser fights were run-of-the-mill platformer bosses. The game to finally break this trend was... Wait, this can't be right. New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Really? A new Super Mario Bros. game actually innovated at something. This is amazing! I finally figured out why four of these games exist! New Super Mario Bros. Wii had a seemingly old-school fight where you just run under Bowser and hit a button, but it's actually a fake-out, and he comes back from the lava to chase you while shooting fireballs. Which not only integrated platforming, but was just also kinda awesome. From this point on, it seemed like the series had figured this stuff out, at least when it came to the endgame fights. A lot of the more minor ones still kept the old formula, but at least we were seeing some improvement. Galaxy 2 still kept the old approach, but 3D Land, New Super Mario Bros. 2, and 3D World all had final Bowser fights that were first and foremost platforming levels which involved Bowser. Things were finally on the right path. And then Super Mario Odyssey came out. New Super Mario Bros. U had regressed in this regard as well, 
but that didn't seem like a very high priority title for Nintendo, so I didn't put much stock in that. But this was different. The final fight under the Wedding Chapel has two phases. The first one is a more advanced version of the traditional style platformer boss from the Cloud Kingdom, but once you defeat Bowser, you have to take over his body in an escape sequence. I thought the second part was a great way to cap off the game, but the first one was pretty concerning, and I honestly still don't understand how they got it this wrong after doing it pretty consistently. The only thing I can think of is that they needed a reason for Bowser to be weakened enough so you can capture him, but considering that Nintendo is known for prioritizing gameplay over all else, I seriously doubt it. This made the future of boss fights in Mario games an open question for a while, but with the announcement of Bowser's Fury, Nintendo would finally have to show their hand. What was the future of the Super Mario boss fight? Oh, come on! This? Really? Not only does it stick with a combat-style approach, but it's just kinda awful. The pussy ride at the end was decent, so it's not like all hope is lost, but I wouldn't bet on another boss as good as climbing up a building with Bowser's chasing you anytime soon. While I was in the thick of all those Mario games, I took a bit of a detour to replay Celeste and something kind of interesting happened. Celeste has three boss fights, but unlike in most of the other platformers I'd played, they didn't break the flow of everything else going on. At the end of Chapter 2, you're first introduced to Badeline, a reflection of Madeline's anxiety, who chases you and even starts duplicating herself. To close out the next chapter, Mr. Oshiro, the owner of the hotel you've been exploring, gets mad at you for trying to leave and turns into a giant floating head who zooms at you every few seconds. The next two chapters don't have any boss fights, but chapter 6 opens with Madeline dreaming, where she talks to Madeline about <laughs> before falling into a crystal cave. After exploring the cave for a bit, a bunch of Madeline's hair starts leading you along. Once you eventually reach her, as one might expect, a piece is not able to be reached and the two start fighting. Badalyn shoots tiny orbs at you as parts of the cave start breaking off and falling. You have to get around all those obstacles to hit Badalyn and keep moving. So, looking at all these boss fights, which one of them has the player do something other than platforming? Don't worry, I'll wait. If you said none of them, congratulations! You have basic eyesight and video game knowledge! And just like with the Mega Hammer, the ideas used earlier in the level are reused later, except that now they're still in the context of platforming. They meld together with the rest of the game perfectly and feel as fair as anything else you'll see along the way. It's just amazing, and I want every platformer with boss fights to use this approach going forward. So, what did we learn today? When you're taking something from one type of game to another, it's not going to work unless you do some tweaking to fit it in a new context. It's a bit like translating languages. If you want to take a Spanish sentence and put it into English, instead of just replacing each word with the direct English equivalent, you have to figure out what the sentence means and replicate that meaning in English. When designing games, you have to try to replicate the same experience rather than the exact same mechanics. Oh, and also that Celeste is really good. I'd like to thank Dizak1 for being my first and only patron so far, and giving me the motivation that comes from knowing that other people value your work. If you want to access each video essay a week early with a shoutout, and have me answer a question in the credits, get exclusive posts and sneak peeks, a list of my backlog, and, since it's E3 season, an updating list of my thoughts on gaming conferences before and after they happen, you can subscribe for just $1 per video.